This is London, the capital of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. At one time, much of the world was ruled from here. The British Empire stretched from colonies in America, sultanates in India, isles in the Caribbean, and desert kingdoms in Africa. For such a small place, it's only a bit larger than Greece, and even today has less than 65 million people, its influence on the world has been extraordinary. Shakespeare, the Industrial Revolution, the English language, even the Beatles, all hail from the United Kingdom. The UK has also had, and still has, a remarkable impact on the democratic world. We see the origins of human rights law in the Magna Carta signed in the year 1215. And the UK's legislature is called the mother of all parliaments because of its role as a model for new democracies over the past 200 years. In world politics, the UK is a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, a leading member of the European Union, and the United States' closest ally. There's no question that knowing this England, as Shakespeare called it, is to go a long way towards understanding democracy itself. I'm Bob Beatty, and in this program, we will explore the British political system to better know and understand the keys and nuances of a parliament that in some form or other has influenced every single democracy in the world. on the British parliamentary system. What is the British Parliament? What does an individual member of the House of Commons, or MP, do? And what is up with the House of Lords? We hope to answer those questions and more as we cross the Thames River to the Palace of Westminster for this program, the British Parliament. The British parliamentary system is essentially uh, parliament, obviously, uh, a parliamentary rather than presidential system. Uh, we have 659 MPs. Each one of them has their own constituency. And the uh, aim of parliament is essentially, of course, to run the country. However, what really matters in parliament is that members of the government, uh, Tony Blair, for example, is also an MP, so are most of the major ministers. They're all MPs, and therefore, of course, we don't have separation of powers in the sense that you would have in the United States. Control of the parliamentary timetable is very much the responsibility of government um, and in fact uh, most of the work of parliament, although sometimes it seems very exciting when we have things like Prime Minister's question time when the parties appear to be uh, fighting it out across the floor of the House of Commons, most of what goes on in parliament is relatively routine. Well, first of all, actually, incidentally, sorry. First of all, I should welcome the Right Honourable Gentleman to his new position. And, and to say how delighted I am that someone written off under the last Conservative government is now given the chance to rehabilitate himself under Labour. Well, I'm uh, very grateful to the Prime Minister for his warm words of welcome, but uh, 
I'm afraid he, he really didn't answer the question. Let me give him the answer. Let me give him the answer. I love the job. job I'm doing. I mean, it is, it's, it's a wonderful uh, place to be here. I mean, I was, uh, I got here in my mid-50s rather later in, in life than most MPs. And it's a great uh, liberating position to be here, uh, to know that uh, instead of uh, shouting at the television, uh, you can uh, face, face with the Prime Minister and tell him where he's gone wrong. And uh, you can have a little bit of influence on how the world is run and uh, particularly how Britain is run. So it, it is, uh, I mean, it's a wonderful job for anyone to be in. I mean, do it for nothing. I mean, I, if I had any money, I'd pay to do it. But they actually pay you as well, which is extraordinary. Well, I believe it's, uh, it's probably the most satisfying job that, uh, that, that I could do. And uh, unless you can be a great surgeon or someone else that uh, it wouldn't say you, uh, you can save life or uh, make a great difference and make some mark major scientific discoveries. If you're a person of, uh, of average ability, you can have a very satisfying life uh, in the world of politics, as long as you set out what your horizons and your aims are. You divide your role up really, I think, into three areas. The first is representing your constituency, and that's a very intimate relationship here. I represent 60,000 adults, 60,000 voters. Uh, most of them feel they have a claim on my time. They can come and see me if they want to book in and see me at a surgery with a personal problem. Then they can usually do that within a week or two. Uh, and I'm in the district, the constituency, every weekend, and I'm expected to be there and be involved in their events. So it's a very intimate relationship. Uh, and, and so I have a sort of primary duty to take up their personal problems. So if they can't, you know, they've got a problem with their welfare benefits or they've got a problem with uh, anything that's going through Parliament at the moment, they bring it to me. The second role is your role in Parliament, where uh, as an opposition member, what you're seeking to do is, is to be a good legislator. Uh, it's it's a, a kind of slightly more confused role here because we've got the executive in Parliament. So you're both trying to be a legislator and hold the executive to account at the same time. And, and we've got ministers coming before us that we can actually uh, question. So a lot of your time is about grilling the executive, but it's that parliamentary role. And then the third role is your party role. And, and the party role will vary. Uh, from individual to individual, I've taken on a substantial responsibility as a spokesperson on information technology. So a lot of my time is taken up uh, creating policy for my party on information technology, meeting people in the industry, uh, and really sort of pushing the cause to show that my party is doing well in information technology. Primarily, it is to represent the views of the constituents of Beckenham in the House of Commons and to take an active part in the legislative process. There is, however, a lot of pressure, and this is actually a fundamental constitutional change, where an MP is seen to be uh, doing an awful lot of social work. And the social work aspect is sorting out constituents' problems that, frankly, should have been sorted out by the organisations involved long before they get to the level of a Member of Parliament. I mean, my main job as MP is to represent this area and the people who live in the area. So, first and foremost, I take the constituency casework and the dealings that I have with individual constituents as my top priority. <clears throat> Sometimes that, act, that means acting almost as a social worker. Sometimes it uh, involves acting as an advocate, often with bureaucracies or agencies that don't give unless they're pushed hard enough. Um, but, and this is the um, special role an MP can play, often it involves picking up a, 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 an individual local problem and pursuing it nationally, either with ministers, civil servants or national agencies. And sometimes um, using public exposure in Parliament as a way of reinforcing pressure. So it's picking up casework, uh, number one. And last year I dealt with just over 1,500 individual cases. Uh, and that's, that's out of a total population in the constituency of about 60,000. There, there are a number, I've done over 10 commandments on, 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 uh, on the party, which I, I can't remember them all. But I think the most important one is, as an MP, I mean, certainly to support our my party is, is there, but to enlarge its horizons, uh, to, to convey messages uh, uh, in, in a way that's uh, uh, coloured with uh, humour and uh, with, with a lightness of touch, we hope, so it becomes palatable, so to, to communicate effectively. But I think the most important of the, the my Ten Commandments is that we should neglect the rich, uh, the obsessed, and the 
tabloid press and seek out the silent voices. The people that we uh, should be serving are those who don't beat a path to uh, our doors. They're the ones who, uh, who are not articulate and not well-heeled and not advantaged. And if we do that successfully, uh, we serve our, uh, our people well as uh, their representatives. Every MP or Member of Parliament takes on a number of roles as a member of the House of Commons. The first is the legislative and scrutiny role, in which MPs shape, debate and scrutinize legislation. MPs also have to represent their constituency, a role which is taking more and more of their time and has made some, such as Jackie Late, say that she sometimes feels like more of a social worker than an MP. Part of this role is scheduling what are called advice surgeries. These are appointments MPs have with constituents to hear their problems and concerns. Problems and concerns that constituents often expect MPs to take back to London and do something about. And do you get out when there's not an election and still meet people? Or, uh, I do. I, um, I do my fixed advice surgeries in the office and at the town hall, but I also do uh, street surgeries. So I'll leaflet uh, 200 houses, for instance, right. and, uh, and if they want to see me, they'll put it up in the window and I'll call and see them. And so um, what I find is that if you go to people like that, uh, then <coughs> you come across problems and uh, they contact you in a way that makes it better. Um, and they'll, come, they'll come to me if I go to them. My godmother was an MP, coincidentally, in a neighbouring constituency. And she used to be able, in the 60s, to reply to all of her constituents' letters by hand. I now have two staff, and it's been a, an exponential increase, and in fact, it has worsened since 1997, because an awful lot of the Labour members who came in came from a social work, public sector background, felt that their job as an MP was much more to uh, be a social worker. And so a lot of the changes that have taken place in the House of Commons has been to facilitate the social work role rather than the legislative and scrutiny role. I'm going to do a shopping. So you're doing something wrong somewhere? Well, we used to sell for that. Yeah, we're touching this band in South Yorkshire. It'll be 10p, is it? Are you waiting for him? It'll be 10p. Where's the display? I'm just saying it for you. It'll come back again. Let's go to shopping. Another role for many MPs is the party role. Along with his other duties, John Healy served as the Personal Private Secretary, or PPS, for Gordon Brown, Secretary of the Exchequer in the Blair government. Well, the first characteristic of the week when Westminster sitting is that it's, uh, it, it's divided between uh, home here in the constituency and uh, four, four, normally about four days away down in London at Westminster. So, what I make a point of doing is dropping our six-year-old son off at school first thing on Monday morning and I, I, I stick to that come what may and then normally I go to the train station straight down to London. Um, what I like to try and do is, is, is clear as much as I can when I'm down there so I have a, a ridiculously long working day down there. I, I take the view that if I'm in London, I'm in the Commons, I may as well be working. Uh, so Monday to Thursday I'm in London. I do whatever I can to get home again on Thursday night. I don't care if it's two in the morning. Uh, if I can do that, I'm there when he wakes up in the morning on Friday, and again, I take him to school on, on a Friday. So Monday to Thursday in the Commons, um, I would try and do uh, a couple of hours um, casework and correspondence before about nine, nine o'clock in the morning. Most of my morning would be tied up with uh, meetings at the Treasury, um, Sometimes with, sometimes without Gordon Brown, that's part of my job as PPS. The, the afternoon, uh, there may be duties in the Commons, uh, committees or in the Chamber. Um, part of my job as, uh, as, as parliamentary aide to Gordon Brown is to be his eyes and ears in Westminster, so I, I have to be around and I have to be available uh, for MPs that can't get to Gordon, but get to Gordon through me. Um, and so I normally will get back to my desk again at about 10 p.m. and then often three or four hours clearing what I haven't been able to do during the day, mixture of casework, bit of research, 
work on the different issues I'm following, um, and then back again in the morning. So that's Monday to Thursday, um, and then Friday's a day devoted to the constituency, uh, work in the office here, picking up casework, sometimes surgeries, advice surgeries, often visits, local groups, employers, um, things like that. Saturdays uh, would tend to be advice surgery in the morning and then I, try, I normally try and uh, stop at that point so that Saturday afternoon and Sunday is, is there for the family. Because I don't want to interrupt the angels dealing with the gentleman who's got some interesting views. I'll just give you background. Uh, quite often people have difficulty with the uh, health service sure. because of waiting times and waiting lists. And his particular case, he'd been waiting for quite a long time for this operation, a very serious operation too, and it had not come through. So I worked with his doctor, his normal doctor, to see if we could get it brought forward. And eventually we did. Now, it shouldn't work like that. I mean, it shouldn't be a letter from an MP that says, come on, you know, this ought to happen. Yeah. But in that particular case, we were able to just make sure that all the medical evidence was put forward, and eventually they did bring it forward, and it was... And you supply a letter and a phone yes, call, yes, and yes. just sort and of... And chase, and chase. And Nikki and, the, and, the, uh, and my colleagues in the office also then do an automatic follow-up. If we haven't had a response after a certain period, automatically follow up and see what's going on. Wow. All right. Unlike in the United States House and Senate, Members of the British House of Commons are not given a large office staff and have to do much of their casework, speech writing, and research on their own. I've got uh, three staff, um, then they arrive. Uh, we have a, a sum of £70,000 for staff now, which is uh, very generous compared to what we had in the past. We can employ two and a half, three people, and good salaries, and adequate salaries to survive in, uh, in London. And I depend on them greatly. They're, uh, Three talented, uh, resourceful people who, uh, who, are, who are good researchers, who can write reports, and give me a hard time, and will all tell me when I'm wrong, and uh, we, which is the best uh, best thing to look for in staff. Staff who will tell you off and tell you when you're being lazy or foolish or uh, uh, underachieving. And I get an allowance each year. Um, it's a set set pot of money. It uh, is about fifty thousand pounds. From that I have to employ staff, I have to rent my office, I have to buy stationery, I have to cover the cost of my mobile phone or pager, uh, so it has to cover the whole lot. That allows me to employ one full-time member of staff here in the constituency and one part-time member of staff to support me down in Westminster, and that's my total, that's my total staffing. That probably means I do a lot more hands-on uh, individual casework than your average uh, uh, US politician. Mm -hmm. uh, it also means I probably do a lot more of our research, and speech writing, uh, writing of articles for the media, all that sort of additional stuff. Uh, you know, I, I tend to do a lot of. Um, I like doing it, um, but I don't have the staff to uh, su support me. I mean, we have a much smaller constituency than, uh, than American uh, politicians. Of course, I, they, there are about 70,000 people uh, in, on my patch. Uh, which is enough to look after, but I think the uh, we, we also have the support of a library staff. It's very good, and uh, other staff here. We're going to do a bill. We rely on those to uh, to take us through the system and to actually draft the bill. So so we're okay, and, and uh, things are so much better than they were. You know, when I came here 20 years ago, we are much better off. But the um, I mean the, the the work increases to fill the available time. And, you can either, I mean, you can go off and live in America if you want to do name name, they still pay you wages, uh, it doesn't make any difference. Or, or you can work around the clock and still go around with your head in a cloud of guilt because you feel you've neglected this or you haven't done as much for that constituent as possible. But I believe the, uh, you know, it, it's reasonable at the moment compared to most parliaments and most regional parliaments. We're better paid and we're better, we have better allowances than, than ever before. And they've increased by uh, a great amount in the last uh, 10 years. There's a great deal of party discipline in the House of Commons. Each of the political parties expects its members to follow the party line, and most of them do. They follow the party line not necessarily because they're bullied or cajoled into uh, taking decisions which they fundamentally disagree with. There's what one writer has called a culture of obedience, whereby 
MPs who have always supported a particular party, once obviously they're in Parliament, will continue to do so. And certainly, OK, there are mechanisms uh, whereby party discipline is ensured and sometimes threats or even bribes are offered in the form of uh, jobs and whatever to individual members. They just generally do follow the party line. Also, um, it's sometimes very difficult to hide because the voting system in the House of Commons is in no way electronic. Each member of Parliament, is, it is clear who he or she, um, uh, sorry, what he or she is voting for, simply because they pass through a particular lobby, and by passing through the lobby, they're then counted and their votes are registered. So it does make life difficult for those uh, who, shall we say, wish to express opinions uh, that are in uh, opposition to the, the party line. Yes. Oh, yeah. I think yes. I think it's uh, uh, compared to most legislatures throughout the world that uh, MPs vote for their own parties, taken as a matter of loyalty. There's some justification for it because we were elected uh, as representatives of what Labour stands for, or what Conservatives stand for, or what uh, White Cymru stands for, rather than for our own personalities or what, because we are wonderful human beings. I think we accept that. People don't vote for persons, they, they vote for parties. So there is a, a general understanding that the right thing is to support what the Labour Party supports. Well, I think I've um, voted against my party in this Parliament about 20 or 30 times. And there are issues in which the party has been, I believe, profoundly wrong. And uh, I, I'd have the support of my uh, local party, my constituency, uh, would be backing me on that. The principal one has been on the Iraq war, where I believe we were deeply and seriously wrong. And we took a decision on an entirely false basis, on the belief that there was weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, which clearly there weren't. And we sent British soldiers in to kill and, and be killed. Uh, on, uh, on, on documents that were forgeries and falsehoods. So are there some votes in which the party says we really need everybody to vote for this one? Are there other votes where they say do whatever you want? Yes, they, they are. The, the, there are votes. We, we have a system of whipping one line to th and three line whips. One line whip you can uh, virtually not be here and uh, you, you really don't have to vote for the party. Don't be worried about it. But when they impose a three line uh, whip, uh, it means that uh, they, they want to know if you're opposing it, they will try to persuade you otherwise if you, if you state what your views are. And on the Iraq war there were huge, uh, there was a huge amount of pressure put on all MPs uh, in, in the group and individually in order to persuade people to support the government line. But I, 140 MPs didn't support the government, which is the biggest uh, revolt uh, there's ever been I think, in, in, in history, certainly for, uh, for a very long time. It's such, a, it's such a large number of MPs, in spite of the pressure put on, which included saying, well, we're, you know, we're going to have a new government, we're going to resign, we're going to, uh, you know, they, they, they went uh, nuclear on it with, with the threats to people. But in spite of that, people felt so strongly that a large number voted against. And of those who uh, voted for the government, many of those are unhappy now because they felt they were deceived uh, by the government whips by presenting a case that's now uh, collapsed. You're expected to vote for the party on any issue that is regarded as an issue of party policy. And the theory and the philosophy behind that is that you are elected as a Conservative member of Parliament, you therefore subscribe to the party policy, therefore unquestioningly you should be supportive of the policy. Now, there are times when we have what's called private, uh, private members' issues, which tend to be matters of conscience, and then uh, the party will decide that there will not be a, a three or a two line whip, but there will be what's called a free vote and you can vote according to your conscience. Whatever I do as an individual MP, I'm under no real illusions that people in this area voted for me because I was the Labour candidate. Now, I like to think that some of them will vote for me in this election because of what I've also been doing as John Healy, the Labour MP. But essentially, they voted for a Labour MP uh, to be part of a Labour government to produce a Labour programme. Now, I think therefore that it's uh, quite a serious step actively to oppose the sort of legislative programme that the government wants to bring in. Uh, my job, I think, is to steer and influence it where I can at an early stage, uh, rather, than, uh, rather than outright um, vote against uh, the Labour government. I wouldn't rule it out, and there have been a couple of, a couple of issues where I've been uh, uh, faced with a really pretty difficult decision, um, unhappy with what we've been planning to do. 
uh, <coughs> and having to take a judgment at that point, but the uh, play of the parties, and if you like, the, the role that the party plays within Parliament is, is, is strong. A key aspect in Parliament is getting your party to vote together, which is the job of the party whips. James Arbuthnot served as the opposition whip for the Conservative Party. There is more party discipline in Great Britain. Um, there is much less... Uh, the, 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 I, I don't know whether the whether pork barreling is the, is the proper expression, but there is, there, there is less of that. Although most things that come to the United States come to the United Kingdom ten years later. So uh, maybe we'll find the whipping system breaks down in the United, uh, in the United Kingdom. The opposition chief whip has a different job in opposition. Uh, the government chief whip has a job which is essentially to get the government business through. Um, and th that involves uh, using the right arguments, the right persuasive methods on government uh, MPs uh, in order to achieve the business. Um, the opposition chief whip has uh, uh, a much more subtle job, in a sense, which is to keep the morale of the opposition party reasonably good, and to keep them together, to keep them working together for a common goal, so that they, having been, by definition, defeated at the previous election, uh, they've got to improve their uh, showing and their um, performance for the next election. So keep everyone as properly occupied as possible, giving them a proper job, making sure that the, uh, the work is handed to the people with the ability to do it, making sure the allocation and effort responsibility is right. So it's, it's a morale job rather than a defeat the government job. At least in the present climate it is. If the government's majority were smaller, it would change, and it might be that then we would have a real opposition, a real opportunity to take the government by surprise and defeat them in a vote. Um, we very nearly did, actually, even with a majority of 170 against us, we did get within 24 votes of beating this Labour Party during the last Parliament. Um, but uh, sadly, the Liberal Democrats were not with us. And so we didn't quite make it. Well, originally, of course, the chief whip literally had the job of getting everybody into the same uh, uh, lobby to vote in, in, the, in Parliament. And you've, I think, uh, adopted in the States the same name, though people probably wouldn't any longer recognize its origin. It goes back to hunting, in fact, fox hunting, where you have a whipper in who makes sure that the hounds go in the right direction. These days, in my party in particular, it's much more of a liaison and communication role. I have to try and make sure that my colleagues know what business is coming through in the House of Commons, know who's going to speak in a debate, take part in a discussion, going on to a committee, and that the team works. If you like, I'm the team manager. I think it's much more comparable these days to the team manager in the sporting field than it is to anybody in the hunting field. Probably there are there are um, there's there's less offer to keep you in line by way of enticements or incentives and and, and uh, uh, more emphasis on an attempt to um, uh, I wouldn't say sanction you but I mean it doesn't interest me and I don't go on them but yeah. you know some MPs you know enjoy and get a lot out of uh, foreign visits now you know for any MP that voted against the government they'd suddenly find that those uh, tr trips on the parliamentary delegations to the Caribbean dried up for instance um, now that's not, it's not a terribly serious point but that's an indication of the way it operates um, yeah can a uh MP be told that he or she won't be the candidate in the next election? Does the party have that kind of power? Yeah, ultimately, ultimately the, what, what we would describe as the party whip, that's if you like the party sort of uh, stamp of approval and, uh, uh, and uh, identification of you as a, a, 
in my case a Labour Party politician, could be withdrawn. Um, in rare instances it is. Um, and come the point where selection goes on for candidates at a, a future election, then, then that person will find that they could not be a Labour Party candidate. There can be, in theory, repercussions. In practice, punishment doesn't work nearly as effectively as uh, making, as rewarding people and making them want to vote in the same way. So the job of the chief whip is not to punish people. Well, it is to give severe, sometimes, tellings off to people who fail to follow the party line. And that's, uh, from time to time, what I would do. But uh, once I had reached that stage, I would have uh, failed in that particular aspect. So what I would be trying to do would be to forestall any voting against the party line by knowing everybody in the party very well indeed, knowing what they would be likely to do, making sure that if it was against our interests they didn't want to do it uh, by motivating them in the right way. So. It's, a, it, it's a, an all-time constant job of work of assessing people's character and working out uh, how best to get them all to pull together. Well, there's a tradition that the Conservatives have always been able to ensure on loyalty to their leadership by sidling up to the Member of Parliament that looked as if he might be going the wrong way and saying, uh, George, I know you're not really interested in becoming a lord, but don't you think Cynthia would like to be a lady? And that's dropping the heavy hint on the Conservative side, which is very effective, because they all want to go to the House of the Lords. On the Labour side, it's been a different tradition. It's been, if you don't toe the line, my boy, we will tell your folk back home, and they might very well decide they don't want you to be candidate for your safe seat next time. Now, neither of those would work with the Liberal Democrats. We're far too democratic. So I'm afraid in our case, we simply have to persuade people that this is the way to go. And since we are not any of us really career politicians, you wouldn't be a career politician if you came to the Liberal Democrats. It's far too difficult to get elected. Uh, people on the whole tend to be of the same persuasion, same frame of mind. And fortunately, I don't have many problems of party discipline. One of the more contentious issues regarding constitutional reform in the United States Kingdom concerns what to do with the House of Lords. Keep them as they are, scrap them all together, or somehow reform them. The Labour Party in 1997 campaigned on the idea of somehow reforming the House of Lords. And to be sure, they have been reformed since 1997. But where to go from here? To turn it into some sort of United States style Senate, or to keep that elite element to it? We did hear from a num number of members of parliament about where to go with the House of Lords. The, the House of Lords um, is quite a unique institution in many respects because unlike most legislative assemblies around the world, Congress, French National Assembly, whatever, it is not elected. There have been very significant changes in recent years because up until 1999, in theory, the House, uh, the House of Lords had a potential membership of something like 1,100 members because anyone who had a peerage, uh, which is uh, obviously, you know, being a Viscount or a Lord, you have to, I believe, be uh, uh, at least a Knight of the Realm, um, was entitled to sit in the House of Lords, as were the senior bishops of the Church of England. Now, in 1999, in response to uh, New Labour's election promises, they did end the hereditary principle, whereby simply the only people who could now sit in the House of Lords um, are life peers. However, what life peers are are simply those who have been given uh, public, uh, recognition of their public service um, and often are former members of the House of Commons, senior government ministers, but also included are people like former trade union leaders, captains of industry, etc. But they, although 
have the right to sit in the House of Lords, their peerage does not pass on to their son. So, end of the hereditary principle. The government, however, did do a deal with the House of Lords in that they agreed to allow 92 hereditary peers to remain for a transitional period. And those 92 hereditary peers were chosen by the existing members of the House of Lords. So in reality, although it's not um, a directly elected body, it no longer is, as I've said, dominated by uh, those who just inherited their titles. It's very different from, the, uh, from Congress. The House of Lords cannot uh, be involved in tax raising matters, but they look at any legislation that is going through and will often amend it. And at the present moment, the House of Lords is the only legislative forum we've got to really challenge and take on the some of the wilder ideas that this government has. The role of the House of Lords is and always has been to act as a revising chamber and as a bit of a break on the over-enthusiasm sometimes of elected politicians. Um, so when the House of Commons sends new legislation up to the House of Lords, uh, the House of Lords are able to spend a good deal more time with actually a very deep amount of expertise on that legislation. Um, during the last two parliaments, though, when in the House of Commons there has been such a huge government majority, a majority significantly larger than the main opposition party itself, uh, it has been the House of Lords that has been more effective in holding the government to account because the government does not have a majority in the House of Lords. The House of Lords feels constrained about using the fact that the government doesn't have a majority, and so from time to time they back away from outright confrontation. But um, it has been the government's uh, main check and balance, apart from the media, because the House of Commons, frankly, at the moment, is not working well. And the House of Lords is a... Uh a revising chamber. They do a useful job in that, and having a closer look at uh, legislation than the Commons often does, and they have people of some authority and uh, standing and expertise who can uh, improve uh, legislation. Uh, but uh, they're, uh, they're entirely unelected, and uh, they're a mixture of uh, inherited lords who, uh, who are still there, and they're there because, mainly because their families had a history in which their great-great-great-great-grandmother was the mistress of a king, or their great-great-great-great-grandfather was a crook, a robber baron, whatever it might have been. But they, they are, a, it's an extraordinary anachronism, a hangover from the past, that people are not there by the first past the post system, but uh, a system as described by Tony Benn, who is, uh, as the first past the bed post system, the first born would go there. And it's indefensible that people should be chosen on that basis. It was a disastrous experiment to have the people's uh, peers, to have people in who were chosen as representatives of ordinary people. And it was an almighty disaster because the people who were appointed were very much the same people who were going in there either by birth or because of privilege in life. And I remember hearing the chairman of the committee who appointed the so-called people's peers saying they couldn't have anyone who was a waitress or a bus driver in the House of Lords because they wouldn't be articulate uh, to make their point. But as someone who was a bus driver for three years and who married a woman who was a waitress for the same period, I was very offended by that and both of us can string a few words together and could make a case. But the, the same kind of snobbery privilege uh, that's been part of the House of Lords for, for centuries is still there, but there's been a reluctance to change it, a reluctance not only from the, uh, from the Lord itself, who will fight tooth and lane to uh, remain there, but also from uh, Tony Blair, who said he's in favour of a wholly appointed chamber. The United Kingdom's third party, the Liberal Democrats, want to see the House of Lords turn into a wholly elected chamber, as Richard Allen explains. We're one of, this is one of the areas where we do have a strong difference with the Labour government, certainly not everyone in the Labour Party. Uh, but with the Labour government, because we firmly believe in a democratic House of Lords, 
the, the whole approach of the Liberal Democrats has been to be constitutionalists. We actually are quite in favour of a, a written constitution, a written Bill of Rights, uh, and a defined constitution within which all the various bodies who, who influence our lives are democratic. And the fact that the House of Lords remains undemocratic is a major problem for us in an area where we have attacked the government very robustly. The Labour Party is split. A lot of members of the Labour Party uh, agree with us. They'd like to see a democratic House of Lords. But the Labour government doesn't want to change things because it, it's too convenient for them uh, at the moment. Our proposal for the House of Lords would be to replace it with an elected Senate. Uh, and we see the elected Senate as being elected in thirds. So senators would serve for six years, a third elected every two years, which may sound familiar. Um, and and uh, th those senators would represent regions of the United Kingdom. So, so we see, we've looked at what people have for their uh, second chamber in their legislature across the world. And that's quite a common system, uh, that kind of elected Senate, where you're electing people on a different cycle from the first chamber, uh, because the first chamber in the British system has to remain supreme, the House of Commons. Uh, the House of Lords is on a different cycle with different powers and people elected for a little longer. But the important thing is that they're elected. At the moment, nobody elects them. They're appointed in there. And, and if we saw, I don't know, a developing country do that, where the president of, of Zimbabwe appointed everybody to the second chamber in the Zimbabwean parliament, we'd cry outrage. This is, this is an affront to democracy. And yet we do it here in the UK. So, so I mean, we feel that way. It's an affront to democracy and needs sorting out. Um, but I say there seems to be a, a real reluctance on the part of the government to tackle this. They seem happy to sort of let it ride as it is now. We want the second chamber to be elected and we look with envy at your Senate. We would be quite happy to have so a direct, Senate. directly elected? Yes. And we might very well go for the same sort of system as you to make it a slightly different electoral system to, to, to the other house. Is it possible that may happen or do you have any...? Uh, I think this present government is a bit too cautious. It's a bit too conservative. What would I like to see in terms of the House of Lords reforms? I'm, I'm on the Lords Reform Committee and I've uh, been hoping to see the government live up to its prom promise in, its, uh, in the programme it, it set out uh, for, uh, before the last election, that we would have a more democratically uh, accountable House of Lords. Uh, I would like to see that combined with retaining some of the deep expertise uh, that the House of Lords currently has. So I would like to see some people in the House of Lords elected, some people appointed as now. Um, but I would above all like to see the House of Lords be independent of the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister currently appoints people to the House of Lords. He appoints people to uh, oversee his own actions. Uh, the contradictions in that uh, are pretty clear, and I would like to see the House of Lords become much more independent of the Prime Minister. Well, we said that, uh, that, that we ought to see more of an elected element, uh, because if once you start tinkering around a mechanism that is working, which it was, then you have to think through the logical consequences of it all. And the stagnant position of the House of Lords at the moment and the unsatisfactory position, uh, however useful they are to us as, as, as the Commons, is uh, one that is not thought through and it is absolutely classic of the government that they've produced a piece of legislation and haven't thought through the consequences. Um, the, the difficulty is that there is a, a public cynicism about politics and politicians. So. When, when the public are asked really about reforming the House of Lords and having a, an elected House of Lords, they look at it and they say, well, it would be another bunch of those elected politicians that we don't like going in there. So whether it's uh, appointed people or whether it's elected people, we don't see much difference. And uh, there's a kind of general sense of apathy around changing it. It's not, a, it's not top of people's political agenda. That's health and education, the economy and all of that. And so the government have realized that they can probably get away with not changing it. And as long as they don't change it, as long as the House of Lords doesn't have democratic legitimacy, then the Prime Minister and the Ministers, the government who are in the House of Commons, can really bully them into doing what they like. They, they cause a bit of a problem from time to time. But if it comes to any kind of showdown, ultimately the government say, you're not elected and we are, so we win. And what they're really scared about is the dynamic of having an elected 
Senate, second chamber, which might start to assert itself a bit more and could claim legitimacy because it was elected. So in a sense, as long as they are not elected, they're pretty powerless. They, they're a, an irritant, they, they annoy the government, but they can't really do anything. And I think they're very, very scared about having an elected chamber that would, would act as a more effective counterbalance. Mm. We as kind of pluralists in my party, we would sort of believe in a very sort of pluralist democracy with power distributed across different centres. Uh, we would love to see that. But parties like the Labour Party, who have a tradition of, of being in government where they concentrated all the power to themselves, the Prime Minister is supremely powerful in the British system. Uh, they don't want to see power dispersed. And as long as, as only the House of Commons is elected, they've got all that power collected to themselves. The House of Lords, I mean, it's, curious. it's a curious institution. Um, most people, I think, um, see it as a see it as a, just a sort of oddity, really. Uh, there has been changes to the House of Lords. Um, there was a commission of inquiry before we made the changes. That was an attempt to build some sort of consensus for the for the changes. I actually submitted my own evidence to that uh, that inquiry, and I, I argued for a fully elected second chamber. D didn't believe that you could go to it uh, as a directly elected second chamber first in, in one go and I think there are a series of steps that you can get there and I think a chamber like that could be an integrating chamber mm -hmm. that would allow strong regional representation from different parts of the country. However, um, the, the, the government hasn't gone as far as that. It has abolished the, uh, the hereditary right for people by accident of their birth uh, being able to legislate in the UK, which for seven or eight hundred years has stood and uh, uh, I and many others would argue was long overdue for uh, uh, overhaul. But we've still got a, we've still got a, a hybrid second chamber uh, in which um, uh, appointment is the principal way that people take their place. Uh, um, appointments now which are made by an independent commission rather than by the Prime Minister. So that's the other reform that Neighbours brought in. So to remove, in, remove the particular patronage that the Prime Minister had to put people in the Lords. So, you know, we've, we've, I think we've definitely improved the, uh, the, the workings of the House of Lords. I think we've definitely improved its uh, legitimacy and the basis on which it does its work. I still personally think uh, our aim must be to move to a fully democratic chamber uh, as a reforming, uh, revising part of the uh, Houses of Parliament. It certainly will, will, will decline as a, as, a, as a small body, but it still remains very much a conservative body on, on virtually all issues. Uh, there are people who are uh, reporting the status quo and are resistant to change. And it's, uh, it, it's a matter of considerable sorrow to those of us who thought that the coming of Labour governments uh, would mean that at last we do what uh, we, we haven't done for, uh, for, for a couple of centuries and reform the House of Lords. We've re reformed it in a piecemeal system. And Lloyd George, a, a Welsh Prime Minister in the 20s, once said, it's fatal to try to cross a chasm with two leaps. And that's precisely what we're trying to do with the House of Lords. We half reformed it and then tried to do the second half later. And we, you, follow in, you fall in the, in the chasm in the middle of doing that. So we're in a state of uh, limbo at the moment as far as the board is concerned. I think people dislike the Yabu element of Parliament and they do often behave like schoolboys in there. I think it should be less confrontational. I think we should be able to get a better debate without trying to score points, and, and I really wish we could improve that. I think it gives a very bad impression of the country. The most frustrating is the time wasting. That, that we have, um, the, the system is very antiquated, and, and it's interesting you compare it, for example, with the new democracies in Eastern Europe. Uh, you know, we'll go to a European meeting now, and at a European meeting you've got people from Slovenia and Estonia and Poland and all these places where they've developed their democracies, if, if you like, from scratch without baggage. Um, and, and they have a, a much more modern, efficient ways of doing things. Uh, this place is built up on a whole load of tradition that goes back several hundred years, and there's a real fear about changing any, anything. So, so we end up doing a lot of stuff where we waste time. I was here till, till half past one in the morning last night uh, because somebody had spoken for three hours on a motion that meant nothing in order to keep us there for that period of time. 
we've we've got rid of some of that, but there's still a lot left. Um, so that lack of a sort of sense of, of we're here as a sort of corporate body trying to do the job well it, uh, is something that ends up being very frustrating. You can, in a week, feel that you've spent 15 useful hours, but perhaps 30 uh, less useful hours, and, and, and that balance is wrong. I mean, I, I'm a backbencher by choice, which, which is someone who doesn't aspire to office. I, I was uh, on the front bench. I was a, a shadow minister for, for three years I entered Parliament, but I deliberately took a, a decision uh, to go on the backbench and to become a campaigner, because I believe that's more uh, influential, because for various reasons, I believe that the, uh, because of the party discipline, you can uh, exercise very little power, even as a minister, particularly as a junior minister, and you're much more powerful to have a voice on the backbenches. But the difficulty is the, um, the inertia of public opinion, of trying to uh, persuade people of radical ideas. I mean, I believe that the, with the cooperation with one of your countrymen called uh, Professor Brad Rodu from uh, the University of Alabama, I'm trying to put forward a, a case for what will be the biggest single improvement in public health uh, that uh, is likely to occur in the next 50 years. And that's to persuade people who are smokers, who are veteran smokers, not to give up tobacco, uh, but to switch to smokeless tobacco. But we're against, I think that's a big frustration, is refusal of people to shift their views once they've got something in their head. My longest campaign I've been on is on illegal drugs, where we got we're completely barmy in with illegal drugs because of a policy we inherited in the 20s from your country when there was a prohibition of alcohol and they also prohibited a certain number of drugs. They weren't the most dangerous drugs, they weren't the most addictive drugs, and the world has suffered perversely from that the huge use of those drugs and uh, the, result, the consequence has been a vast increase in, uh, in drug crime and in drug deaths. But I, I mean, they, they, it, it's such a slow period to get even medicinal cannabis in use in Britain. It will be this year. But I had a bill about this you know, 14 years ago in this parliament and uh, I was regarded as sort of, a, sort of a sad drug pusher for even suggesting that people should use cannabis. While there are frustrating aspects to being a member of parliament, Long nights and long campaigning for a legislative cause were just two that were mentioned. MPs get a great deal of satisfaction from their job, sometimes getting, as Jackie Late tells us, that nice warm glow that comes from helping somebody. So, not only do MPs get to play a part in making the British Parliament work, they also get to make a difference. In opposition, um, doing, do, doing our best to defeat the government, uh, which is quite difficult when there's a majority of 200 against you, uh, or to change their iniquitous legislation. That's the most satisfying. Part. If we get, if we succeed, that's the most satisfying. And is the most frustrating uh, dealing with this social work aspect, or is there other no, frustrating? No, it's, it's not frustrating. Oh, it's actually uh, very interesting, and hopefully, when you can sort out a constituent's problems, then you know you feel a nice, warm glow. I mean, the the. Two sides to that. Well, one at the personal level, the most satisfying thing is when you can resolve a problem for a constituent. So when somebody's actually been to see you, and uh, at a personal level, this is tremendously satisfying. They've been to see you, they've got a problem, you've sorted it out, and you know that individual, you have a relationship with them. And that personal side of, of the political system, I think, is very important. That's what keeps you going. The fact that Mrs. Smith uh, now has got the welfare check that she needs, you know, which they wouldn't have had without you. Um, and then at the, the kind of more the professional side of the work or the intellectual side of the work, it's, it's being able to satisfy your curiosity. If, if you have a question about how something works, as an MP you can go and find out. So if you want to know, I've always wanted to know how do the courts work, you know, the criminal courts, what happens there. Uh, I can ring up and get an invitation by the judge to come down to the courts and get taken through exactly what happens. I want to know how the, the hospital works. Uh, the surgeon at the hospital will be you know, more than willing to have me down there and tell me how the hospital uh, emergency system works. So it's, it's that ability to sort of find out about things and satisfy your curiosity that, that it, it's a brilliant job for. It opens all these doors so you can go and, and learn about stuff. Yeah, I, I, I try and get out about quite a lot. Um, oh, right. I don't know where, where was that then? I don't know. Well, we'll just... Thanks. a loaf of bread. So you don't find it too jarring to go from the House of Commons to picking up handbags in the, in the meadows? It's all part of the job. And that's, <laughs> I tell you, that's the beauty of being an MP.
We've tried to give you some insight into the basic functionings of the British political system, with the added benefit of hearing from members of Parliament themselves about what MPs do and how Parliament works. I hope that this approach not only helps you understand democracy in the United Kingdom, but also parliamentary systems in general, as they make up the majority of democratic systems in the world. the Palace of Westminster. You can probably even hear Big Ben chiming in the background. This is where the House of Commons meets, and it's not chiming in the background. Yeah. Was it, has it always been there? I mean, I think it's on the eyepiece. It's still there. <laughs> I don't see anything there. I think it's inside there. Yeah, we are. Sorry. <laughs> We're no what help. What part are you from? Camden. 